Well, I had my moment of fame there on the screen. Uh, it was actually a good opportunity for me to do something in Melbourne when we discovered that our flights had been delayed. So I was able to put together my short video, which could be shared. And I was still smiling at that stage, but unfortunately, um, not long after that video was recorded, we were told that our flights were cancelled uh, and that we would be rescheduled on flights the following day, So, uh, which is my excuse for not being at the Gingerbread House event. Um, Brian had to fly home via Adelaide and Launceston from Melbourne to Sydney. Uh, Sophie and I had to go via Brisbane with a five-hour layover. So at the end of the day, it took us 24 hours to get back. Uh, from, so it was a, a dreadful trip back, but um, I had a good rest. Of course, I missed you last week, and Tim faithfully brought us to the end of Ecclesiastes, and now we begin a new series based on um, Christmas. Um, so I'm glad I can be here. I was actually a little worried at, uh, at a stage, thinking I wonder if I'll make it by Sunday, but uh, the, surely Virgin can't um, delay me that long. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I'm here, and I would have been watching via streamline if I had have been delayed. Uh, I don't know who would have preached. Um, but uh, <laughs> maybe Jason could have pulled a sermon out of his pocket. I would have been, can't watch myself on live stream. But hello to everyone on live stream as well. So it's uh, wonderful to see you. Let's pray and then look at this word together. Loving Father, thank you for the good news of uh, Jesus. Thank you, Father, this Christmas we come to celebrate that and we pray Lord that uh, more and more people will hear that news that will be faithful in, in spreading it through kids club through our engagements with different people and through the Christmas services in Jesus name we pray amen I think the time has now come and we must partake in a very important event so I wonder if you're ready it's the lighting of the pulpit so uh, I wonder if everyone's ready. Um, so we, here we go. Um, I'm a bit nervous here. I'm wonder, um, I wonder. I think we have a circuit breaker that will cut it off if something happens. So um, I do. I do have insurance. I think. Yeah. Not that that will save me. But anyhow, we'll see how we go. Um, th you're thinking of Chevy Chase in um, European, what is it, European vacation or whatever it was. But um, no, this will be quite spectacular. I hope you're looking forward to it. Uh, do you think I could have a drum roll? Or we, can we have a bit of a drum roll? Okay, ready? Are you ready? Oh, look, it worked. And no one got hurt. Isn't that amazing? Here we have the pulpit lights, the start of, let's call it Advent, or Christmas season, uh, here at Oceanside Anchor Church, and today we begin. Of course, um, lights. I love lights. I have uh, lights. We have lights in our backyard all year round. We can't wait for Christmas time. We just love them. The fairy lights everywhere. Um, but lights are an important part of Christmas. They provide the magic and the awe of Christmas and they decorate our trees, our streets, our houses. Um, just over the road here, we have a huge Christmas tree with lights on it, and that looks great at night. And uh, slowly more and more lights will come about. Hopefully we'll have some lights on the church pretty soon, and we'll be looking forward to the, the awe that they bring, of course. And, of course, they light up pulpits. Um, that's an important role that they have as well. However, lights are more than just decoration, uh, light is the opposite to darkness. As the theme of darkness runs through the scriptures, so does the theme of light. At creation, the world was in darkness until God said, let there be light, and he brought on creation and a new beginning. Uh, during the plagues in Egypt, darkness was over the earth, which represented judgment, and the lifting of that judgment came when light returned. Darkness represents rebellion against God. Light represents a restored relationship. Light represents his guidance. When God's people wandered in the wilderness, they were led by a guiding light. And the Psalms say, your word is a light unto my feet. 
God's assessment of the world is that it's not in light, but it's in darkness. It has rebelled against him, it ignores him, and it's under judgment. And he longs for a dawn, a new light to arise. This begins our sermon series, Hidden Christmas. As uh, we all know about Christmas, we all have the times together, the parties, the times with family, the giving of gifts, the decorations, but much is lost in that. Much of what we should remember about the birth of Jesus and the uh, objective of this series is to find those things which are hidden and to bring them to the surface once more. So we have lights, but what do those lights represent? And this is in line with uh, Tim Keller's book, A Hidden Christmas. I had ordered them, but they're not quite in yet, so hopefully next week we'll have them on the bookshelf and they'd be wonderful gifts to give people, maybe give someone a Christmas gift, Tim Keller's book, Hidden Christmas, and say, come along to church and you'll actually hear messages which are related to the pa- what's in the pages. So, a hidden Christmas. Uh, here is the outline of this message today, A Light Has Dawned. Two points, darkness in the land, and sec- secondly, darkness gives way to light. Isaiah prophesied during a time of darkness in Israel, and when we look at this passage from Isaiah chapter 9, which was read out from David, thank you David, uh, it's important to understand the political and the historic background. So at the time that this was written in Isaiah 9, darkness was a strong theme. And darkness is a theme in Isaiah. The translation that we have, which is the NIV, re- mentions the word darkness 18 times. Isaiah speaks about the nation Israel being in darkness. And during the 8th century BC, Ahaz was the king of the southern kingdom, Judah. And this is about the events that were going on there. The rising empire was the Assyrian Empire, and they had an insatiable appetite to take over nations, and they were on the march. And the local nations were concerned as Assyria was becoming closer and closer. And the only way to protect yourself was to form alliances. And so the northern kingdom, Israel, and Syria, they formed an alliance to protect themselves against the Assyrian Empire. And then they wanted Judah to join them in the south. So they approached them, and King Ahaz refused to join the alliance. So instead of asking, they decided that they would attack Judah and they they would make them become a part of the alliance. And so now Judah faced the threat of Israel and, and Syria in the north coming to attack them in the south. And the question that is raised here is, will Israel and Syria be successful in attacking Judah, would they succeed? And then we see that the Lord spoke to Ahaz through the prophet Isaiah, who said in Isaiah chapter 7, it will not take place. It will not happen. In other words, Israel and Syria will not succeed. Instead, God's people were to stand firm and were to trust the Lord. They were, after all, the Lord's people. How would they defend themselves? By trusting in the Lord. King Ahaz, however, ignores God's word and he seeks advice from others and decides instead to approach Assyria for his protection. So the problem is where King Ahaz takes his counsel from, not from God's prophets, but from mediums and spirits. And we we read in Isaiah chapter 8, when men tell you to consult mediums and spirits, who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? If they do not speak according to his word, they have no light of dawn. And the result would be, verse 22, darkness and fearful gloom. What is darkness? 
Darkness is the judgment of God. And now because Ahaz has refused to listen to God and instead listen to false voices, judgment would fall on Judah. And like Judah, the human race faces enemies. Evil disrupts our peace and our security. And even if we have a relatively charmed life, it is eventually stolen by the greatest enemy of them all, death. It's the enemy that we all face. And given that darkness, where do we look to for our counsel and our advice? Well, now, no doubt you have many confidants and um, advisors, perhaps financial advisors, perhaps doctors, mentors, coaches, friends. Friends are always a good source of advice given a certain situation. And all these people can help you to navigate through life, but where do you turn for the ultimate answers to life? Well, perhaps you don't. Perhaps you don't look anywhere for the ultimate answers to life. Perhaps you fear you'll wait and see, unconvinced that there is any source of true wisdom. Perhaps you accept your lot and make the most of life while you can, delaying the inevitable that is to come, death. Well, let me ask you, do you reckon you could do better than listening to God, the creator of the world, the one that created everything and created you and me? And what does God say? He tells us to listen to Jesus, who is described in the scriptures as the word of God, the exact representation of of God, his mouthpiece. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In other words, follow him, listen to him, and trust him. He will lead us out of darkness, save us from judgment, and land us safely into God's presence forever. Jesus speaks to you through the word of God, in the power of the Holy Spirit, and invites you to listen to him. On account of not listening to God, judgment would follow is, and, and, and Judah would be cast into darkness. They had to listen. Perhaps I'm not a great listener. Sometimes I don't hear, and Brom will complain, you don't listen. But I'll say, you didn't say that, but I'm not quite sure because I'm not the greatest listener. But we are told to listen to God, to tune our ears and our attention to him. And we do that to avoid God's judgment. And many don't like it when we talk about judgment. They find it negative and would rather talk about happy and positive things why talk about gloom and doom? And indeed, the scriptures do talk about judgment. However, they speak of a time when God's anger will give way to light. His anger will not last forever, and his judgment gives way to salvation. His wrath gives way to mercy. Darkness gives way to light. In chapter 9, verse 2 of Isaiah, we read, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned. And just as darkness is a major theme in Isaiah, light is mentioned 23 times in this one book. So while Isaiah spoke about darkness being God's judgment on his people, he wanted them to know that light follows darkness. He even gives a clue as to where that light would come from. Chapter 9, verse 1. Galilee of the Gentiles, by the way of the sea along the Jordan. In other words, the light will come from the north. Sometimes we think of the light coming from the east as the sun rises. But he says the light would come from the north. What is the north? Was the part of Israel which was first cast into darkness when it would be invaded by the Assyrian Empire and it's the first to fall, will become the first to see the light. 
And what would this light be? Verse 6, a child is born, a son. And what will this child be? A ruler, we read the government will be on his shoulders. And what will his dominion be? Verse 7, he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom. For how long? Forever. And what will that king do for them? He will, verse 3, he will enlarge their nation. Verse 3, he'll protect them, fighting for them as Israel's enemies, uh, enemy Midian during the days of Gideon. Many of you know the story of Gideon, the way that he defeated the Philistines with only 300 men with tr horns and um, torches in jars and managed to uh, defeat the enemy. And in the same way, Isaiah, Isaiah speaks of a bright future, the dawning of a new era with the birth of a child who would become their great leader, their king. Ahaz, he was a bad leader. He was a bad king. Only a good king could lead Israel into light. And Isaiah speaks about this king in glowing terms. Wonderful counsellor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. You know how Messiah's, um, Handel's Messiah goes. It's wonderful, isn't it, to hear all those words, all those descriptions of the king. You know, we're used to hyperbole and exaggeration when it comes to describing leaders. This leader will make America great again. Or all the way with LBJ. Or Kevin 07, we even have them in Australia. This leader, this one, he's the new leadership. He has the fresh ideas. He'll make the place better. He'll, he'll give us a better future. But over time, we grow weary of the advertising campaigns uh, and we, um, we take them with a grain of salt. But can you imagine a leader ever describing themselves as mighty God? Not even Donald Trump would use that one. What king, what leader would call themselves a mighty God? Well, the Apostle John spoke about Jesus when he said, and it was read out this morning, John chapter 1, verse 9, the true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. The Apostle Matthew, at the beginning of his gospel, showed that Jesus was descended from David, the true lineage of the king. And where did he come from? Who was the first to see him? Matthew chapter 4 tells us that Jesus lived in Zebulun, Naphtali, by the lake of Galilee, to fulfill what was written by the prophet Isaiah, the north. See, the scriptures are saying, no, they're, they're shouting, look, Jesus is the fulfillment of this figure in Isaiah chapter 9. Therefore, a light has dawned, darkness and judgment has come to an end, an era of justice, righteousness and joy arrived with the birth of a child. So the prophet Isaiah speaks into the politics of the day and proclaims judgment, but then looks toward the future when a light will dawn and the apostles, they proclaim that that day has come. And then, therefore, we celebrate the birth of the child. The light has dawned. I mentioned before Tim Keller's book, Hidden Christmas, and he says this, In short, Jesus is the divine light of the world because he gives a new life to replace our spiritual deadness because he shows us the truth that heals our spiritual blindness and he is the beauty that breaks our addiction to money and sex and power. Here is a light for us when all other lights go out. The sun is given to us and he comes to reveal, to save. He offers life, a life that he achieved when he died on the cross, when he took the punishment for our sin, but then rose to life again demonstrating that he has the power to give us new life and to revive our dying souls so jesus is a gift 
but gifts are not always accepted. In fact, sometimes they're considered offensive. I mean, you know, what's it saying when someone buys you a diet book for Christmas? Or a personality self-help book, you know, how to make friends and influence enemies. You say to them, what are you saying about me? What is God saying about us when he sends his son into the world to save us from darkness? What's he saying? He's saying you are under judgment and you can't fix it yourself. And that's why I have to go to the extremes that I go to in sending my son into the world to be a light in darkness. That's what he's saying. It's a gift, but not the kind of gift that you may accept readily, but one that you have to swallow your pride to accept. And sometimes we need a dose of reality to be told the truth, no matter how it hurts. You know, the, uh, the emperor, right, who wanted new clothes and he wanted the finest material to be used and the threads to be so fine that you could barely see them and he appointed the the top tailor to make this these clothes for him and when he put them on everyone could see he was naked but no one would tell him the tailor told him it was made by the finest and he said he couldn't feel any sin he said yeah it's that good <laughs> and he'd walk around the streets and people were afraid to tell him that he was naked. And so they praised him for the way he looked and his beautiful clothes. And now because of the praise of the people and the king's hubris, he didn't realize he was naked until a little child in the crowd looked up and he said, Mummy, that man has nothing on. <laughs> and all the self-pretense came to an end. The deception was revealed and the emperor became very embarrassed. I guess we need an emperor's moment. We need to realise that we are naked. And like the hymn says, naked I come to you for dress. I mean, are you willing to accept God's honest, not not? It's his honest opinion, not the one that you want to hear, but what he honestly tells you. You need to be clothed in righteousness because without Christ, you have no covering. So what are you thinking? Are you thinking, what's God saying about me? Am I really that bad in that desperate situation? Or are you thinking, Thank you. I really need the light of the world. I need, God, what you are offering through Jesus. I hope that's the way you're thinking. And I hope you accept God's gift to you. It takes gratitude mixed with humility. This is the greatest gift. You'll get a lot of gifts this Christmas. Some you'll like, some you may not like really didn't need that diet book I'm sure but this this is the greatest gift you'll be offered but it will only be received by faith if you admit your failing and behold the beauty of the light that has dawned a new age of hope and grace has dawned with the birth of a child so a new life dawns in you when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. Jesus is a light that will never fade, flicker or be snuffed out. He is the true light of Christmas. Behold his glory, full of grace and truth. And loving Father, we pray that you would help us to see some of those hidden aspects of Christmas and that we would respond not only in gratitude but in faith and that you would clothe us, clothe us with your righteousness. And Lord, um, we pray that when we do that, when we accept Jesus with faith, true joy 
will be experienced this Christmas. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to now respond in song. Hi, um, we are going to respond in song. Um, this.